And so I remember as a child, uh, I would love the Christmas season. Not only would I get to go visit Santa at the mall, I was anticipating getting all these presents that uh, I, had, I had circles in. Remember, remember uh, consumers distributing? Remember that, that store or uh, the Sears catalog or Canadian Tire? And you circle all these things. You're hoping to get these presents. And, and you get to time off school during Christmas season. My parents, they had some time off work, got to spend time with them. You ate a whole bunch of good food and chocolate chocolates and cookies. I mean, it was an amazing, amazing time of year. But I guess like as time goes on and as you get older, um, it, it, it changes, right? I mean, things come up in life and uh, maybe some of the things that we had hoped for um, don't really happen. And as the years go by, maybe the, um, the marriage we had hoped would last uh, falls apart. And maybe it's the, the, the exam you had hoped to pass um, comes back and you, you didn't pass it. Maybe it's the, the child that you had hoped to bring into this world uh, d- doesn't make it. And maybe um, the promotion that you had hoped to get uh, it, it doesn't happen. And as these things begin to pile up, um, what I find a lot of times is, is that hope gets, it gets snuffed out. And we are left with um, these hopes that are defeated. And when seasons like Christmas come along, it uh, stirs up a lot of emotions stirs up a lot of, of history. It stirs up a lot of hurt. It stirs up a lot of, of pain. And, uh, you know, what the things that we hoped for didn't come, and what came are things we didn't really want. And it, it, makes, it makes everything kind of gray and, and, and dull, and we come into a season that is supposed to be filled with joy and love and peace and hope, And instead of that, as we come into Christmas and New Year's Eve and the passing of another year, we reflect on our lives and these things that we had once hoped for or hoped in are not realized and it it brings them up again. It's just just another year that has not changed, has not gone like we originally thought it would. We had hoped. And uh, today... what we're going to do is, is we're going to take this look at um, this couple that I think has a lot to say to us. And uh, they're found in the book of Luke, uh, right at the beginning, uh, right even before the Christmas story. In the book of Luke, it starts with this, this couple, and uh, I think they have some encouragement for us in maybe uh, living out or understanding, you know, where we've come from and, and maybe living in that hope that, that we felt is defeated or that lost hope, the things we had hoped for. And what we want to do is see what they had to say. See, what, what I love about God's word is that we, all, we, we find time and time again that God uses people who are uh, just ordinary people. I, I mean, fishermen and, uh, and farmers, uh, just, just everyday people, working people. And it's the same with uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, Zechariah, we find out, he is a priest. And um, the priests in the urban centers, uh, they are highly regarded individuals. They're, they're elite. I mean, what I mean by that is that they're, they're highly educated. They're the type of people who have uh, gained a lot of respect in the community. You can go to them with questions, and they will give you answers because they know a lot. And they're, they're high up in the social rankings uh, in the community. I mean, that, that are the, th- those are the urban priests, but... Not all priests were like that, um, because you, you also had this group that were considered uh, like rural priests or country priests, and the people in the city kind of looked at the ones who were out in the country, and these rural priests, they actually, <laughs> they actually had a name for them. And uh, it's kind of funny, because I am technically a, a rural priest uh, as well, but the name that they'd give these priests are idiot priests, okay? And so they use kind of like the country bumpkin priests, right? Like it, it's just these, these people who are out of touch, who kind of live on the borders. And, and, uh, 
And so we, we find out that Zechariah is, is one of these guys, and he's a great guy, but he's a, a country priest. And, um, and so Zechariah, he, he fits in that category, and um, we find out he's about to do something special. And the only reason he's about to do something special is because it's, it's part of his responsibilities. You see, priests were called upon to go and, and to light the incense and to carry out the priestly duties in the sanctuary. And, uh, and, and, and it would rotate through all the priests in the area. Now, for Zechariah, it was his division's turn to go and perform the priestly duties. Now, how they would choose the priest within the division is that they would cast lots. And lo and behold, Zechariah's lot was, was pulled in, and, and he was selected to, to go and, and to perform the priestly duties. This was like a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And as you can imagine, this country bumpkin, that this, if this idiot priest, if you will, is selected to go and perform the priestly duties. And, and, and Zechariah is excited. This is his 15 minutes of fame. He will remember this for the rest of his life. He has been waiting for this moment to happen for so, so very long. And uh, the moment comes and he enters in, and he's doing his priestly duties, but it doesn't really go as planned. It doesn't really go as planned. See, as he's in there, we find that an angel of the Lord appears to him and uh, tells him that his prayers have been heard. And we pick up the story in Luke chapter 1 and verse 11. And here's what it says. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and, and, and gripped with fear. And so we need to realize this. Anytime you hear about an angel in the Bible, it is, people are terrified. These are not like the, 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 the little babies with wings on their back type of thing. These are, they're, they're, people are, are scared of them because they're mighty. They're protectors, right? They're, 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 they're incredible beings. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the, of, of, of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And, and so in the midst of these priestly duties, in the midst of his 15 minutes of fame, this angel appears to Zechariah. Zechariah is terrified because he's not expecting this. He just wants to go smooth. And this angel appears to him, tells him that, that his prayers have been heard, his prayers are going to be answered. And, uh, and to understand the impact of this, we, we kind of need to rewind in Zechariah's life. You see, it, it was a prayer that Zechariah and Elizabeth have been praying for a long time to have a child. I mean, th this was something that way back when um, Elizabeth was a, a, a teen um, and, and, and they got married, th this is something that they would have been praying for, praying for a, a child. And Zechariah and Elizabeth would have found out uh, fairly quickly that, that even though they were trying, they weren't able to have kids. And as they prayed this miraculous prayer of, of hope and healing, I'm sure before they went to bed at night, when they woke up in the morning, throughout their day, they'd talk to God and say, would you please give us a child? And they prayed for this over and over and over again. But as the years went by, the realization set in. We're not we don't have a child, and it doesn't look like we, we ever will. They couldn't. And they wouldn't. And this was, a, this was a burden that they carried. Something that they reflected on. Something that they were upset about. And something that was hard to live with. Because it, it not only was, was a difficult thing because they felt like their prayers weren't answered. But it was also difficult because of the social stigma. See, in those days, 
if you couldn't have kids, the rest of society, they would actually look down on you. The, the, the blame would be placed on secret sin in your life. You must have done something to deserve this. And so you can't have kids because you guys are sinners. And people in society, their culture would have looked down on them. Probably a prayer that um, they used to pray day by day as, as young adults. As the years and, and, and the decades went by, turned into uh, somewhat of an afterthought. Probably a prayer that they were no longer praying at all at the time when Zechariah went into light the incense. And it kind of brings up this question. It's a question I have for you. It's something I wrote down here. And, uh, and, and it's this. What is a prayer that you are no longer praying? I mean, what, what is something that you, you used to pray? Maybe, maybe on a daily, on a weekly, on a monthly. Maybe it's something you prayed all the time that you asked for prayer requests for from other people. It's something that you really desire, that you hoped in God for. And, and what is that thing that you used to pray for that you, that, that, that you no longer do? And what is that thing that you had hoped for that you no longer hope in? You've, you've actually allowed it to be defeated in, in your life, right? Where's hope defeated? See, Zechariah and Elizabeth are described in verse 6 as faithful people. They're described as really good people. They're upright, they're upstanding, they're faithful what are the natural course of events in their life? If time goes by and the answer doesn't come, that, 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 that I've been praying this prayer for a child and, and I haven't heard anything and, and, and now I'm going to, to stop praying for this thing because I, I've lost hope in it because it's been so long, right? And, and they've been waiting for so long that, that when the angel tells Zechariah that he's going to have a, a son, listen to his response in verse 18. Here's what he says. How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and, and, and my wife is well along in, in her years. I mean, Zechariah knows this, this is impossible. What do you mean I'm going to have a son? Like most scholars actually believe that Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were 80 years old. They're in their 80s. And, and he's looking at himself. He's like, look at me. He's telling the angel, look at me. I, I can't have kids anymore. Well, what do you mean I'm going to have a child? That's, a, that's absolutely impossible. I'm not going to be having a child, right? And it's difficult because we see that he doesn't rise to the occasion of faith, right? He questions. Even though the supernatural event happens, he questions God. And uh, we, we can't really get down on him so much because really we're in the same boat. See, when your faith is unprepared, your mind is not prepared. Our expectations, they, they go down. And we don't believe anymore. We don't hope anymore. And see, God takes that lack of faith seriously in Zechariah's life. Zechariah's response to this angel, God sees that. And, 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 and I don't know what exactly he's feeling or what's going on behind the scenes, but from that point forward, after Zechariah says that line back to the angel, he can't speak anymore. His voice is removed. <laughs> he can't share anything. And this is important not only for Zechariah, it's important for Elizabeth. But what you might not know is this is actually important for the whole nation of Israel. All right? See, part of Zechariah's responsibilities and duties after he had gone and done the priestly duties inside of that sanctuary, he would have come out, all priests, this is what they do, they would have come outside and they would have addressed the nation of Israel, placed the benediction of God's blessing on the nation. And as he comes out, he can't even do it. He doesn't have a, a voice, and, and it causes concern among him and among Elizabeth, but among the whole nation of Israel. And so now Zechariah is silent. See, nine months go by. Nine months go by, and uh, in those nine months, I am sure that Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're struggling. They're struggling maybe in their faith, maybe in their understanding, maybe in the realization of what is happening or what is not happening. And, 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 I, and I kind of know that because the Bible clearly says that for five months, Elizabeth remains in seclusion during her pregnancy. Five out of those nine months, she doesn't talk to anybody. 
She's by herself. She, she's locked herself away. And, and I'm asking myself, like, why? why? Why would she do this? And maybe, maybe it's because she was so worried because of her age that the baby wasn't going to come to term or they were going to lose this child or, or, or what's going on with Zechariah? He's not talking to me anymore. I, I don't know what is going on in her life, but clearly she is not healthy in that moment of these five months of, of seclusion. And finally, the baby is born. And uh, her family gathers and they ask Elizabeth, what, what, what do you want to name this child? What's the child going to be named? And she says, the baby is going to be named John. And, and they say, what are, you, what are you talking about? No, it's not going to be named John because in those days you would name your baby after a relative or after someone who's gone before you. And no one in their family was named John. And so they're like, what are you talking about? He's going to be named John. Let, let's, let's go ask Zechariah what he wants to name this child. But Zechariah can't talk. And so they pass him a tablet and, and you know what Zechariah writes down on that tablet? The baby will be named John. Just like the angel told me. And, and what's important is what the name John means. He, he, here's the translation of that name. The Lord graciously gave. And at that very moment, <laughs> at that very moment, as quickly as you Turn on the lights on your Christmas tree. I mean, Zechariah speaks and he can speak again. His voice comes back when he follows through with naming that child what the angel told him to, to, to name him. And, and, and he's so excited and he goes out and he, and he finally finishes off the priestly duties and he goes and, and he gives a benediction, a, a blessing over the nation, over the people of Israel. And these words that he shares, they're prophetic about what is about to take place, right? The Christmas story, if you will. They're spirit-filled. And uh, I, want you to, I want you to listen. I want you to read. I want you to think about these words that Zechariah proclaims. As soon as he gets his voice back, he says this thing. It's, it's a prophetic piece, okay? And we'll check it out. It starts in verse 68. Here's what it says. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he's come to his people and, and, and redeemed them. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. And he, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hands of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all your days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord prepared a way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation. Through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. See, that it's an incredible, it's an incredible word. It's, it's an incredible piece. It is full of, of prophetic insight here that, that comes upon Zechariah when he gets, when the silence is, is broken, when the silence is defeated here. He blurts out all of this thing. And uh, it's incredible because the people who he's speaking to had thought God had pulled himself out of their lives, out of the world, out of the picture. They had experienced silence for so long and now we're coming into a time that focused, focuses on hope. And, and, and I guess I, I wonder, you know, how, how long has it been silent for you? I mean, how, how long has this been going on in your life, maybe it's been going on for so long that you had hoped in something, but you kind of stopped. You had hoped that, you know, the, the family situations and the arguments and the tensions that arise, you had hoped that those would be settled long ago. And yet now it's just kind of silent. The hope is dead. It's, it's defeated. You, you had hoped that uh, your marriage would come back together and, and it hasn't. And it's just silence. 
that prayer that you've been praying for so long. You had hoped that you'd get your life back together and it's just not, it's just not happening like you thought. You had hoped that your kids would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and they haven't. I mean, you had hoped for these things and what you had hoped for, you didn't get. And what you got, you didn't want. And the hope in our lives becomes silent. And for you, it might be one month, it might be six months, it might be nine months. Maybe it's been years. And may, maybe like Zechariah and Elizabeth, you, you stopped praying altogether. It's, it's a distant memory of your past. For Israel, it had been 450 years. God had not spoken. All those prayers, all those rituals, all, 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 all that gathering, all, all that worshiping, nothing. They hadn't heard for 450 years. And in verse 68, it not only breaks nine months of silence in Zechariah's life, it breaks 450 years of silence in the life of Israel, the nation of Israel. See, we had hoped. And just like Zechariah and Elizabeth, they had hoped. And, and as I kind of reflect on that, I just, I, just, I just wonder, I mean, the wonder of Christmas it, could we switch this phrase, and instead of we had hoped, could we ultimately say as we head into Christmas that we hope, that we are a people, that we are a family, that we are individuals who hope? And what does that look like? What, what does it look like in our lives? You see, the beginning, the, the thing about Advent is that Advent lasts four weeks, Four weeks in the midst of craziness, right? The craziness of Christmas, the Santas at the malls, the, the, the parking lots full, the Christmas lights we put on their house, the music on the radio station, the controversies about, about certain songs that, that are played on the radio, the, the presents we got to buy, the cur- turkey we got to cook. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. And in those four weeks, it kind of leads up to Christmas. And just like you pull the lights out of your Christmas tree and, and, and the lights turn off, it's like Christmas ends and it's like, all right, the same old. Back to the life of silence. (laughs) Back to the life of the things that we had hoped for. But what if we, what if we hope? See, what you might not know is that um, in the Christian calendar, Advent is not the end of the year. Do you know that? In the Christian calendar, Advent is actually the beginning of the year. The first Sunday of Advent is when the Christian calendar begins, not not January 1st. And so what that means is that all those things that are going to happen this year, all those ways that God is going to provide, all those miracles that are going to take place, all those things that you had prayed for, that you had hoped for, all those things that are going to happen throughout this year, Advent's the beginning of those. And we have this deep-rooted hope that we can rely on as we press into Christmas. And so the challenge that I have for you this morning is, is like, what are those things that you need to do to rekindle hope in your life? What is the step that you need to take to, to, to continue to hope, to go back to those prayers that you used to pray, to, to hope for something that is, that is beyond ordinary, something that only requires God, that, that the only God could do. See, the best is yet to come. It came on Christmas morning, and the best is yet to come in your life through God. This Christmas, my call as we celebrate hope is to defeat the silence, rekindle hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, I know that as we head into Christmas season and these next few weeks, uh, there's a lot of people who, who just find this time of year so abrasive, so difficult, because they, they relive and they rehash pain and, and difficult things that they've gone through in their lives and and it's, and it's so hard to, 
to reflect on hope and joy and love and, and faith and, 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 and peace and, and goodness. It's, it's, it's hard to reflect on that stuff. And God, we take those things that we had hoped in, hoped for, that we, we felt were just defeated. God, we, 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 we turn them back to you. And just like a wide-eyed kid on Christmas morning as a child in my life and just remembering the, the excitement that I had for Christmas morning, Father, may we rekindle that wide-eyed hope that we have in the birth of Jesus and what it means for us. May we live that out in the days ahead, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.